So I'm going to talk about the age of autonomous vehicle logging. It's, uh, it's not your grandpa's 65 Mustang or your, or your Cadillac these days. Autonomous vehicles are coming. And the, the day and the age of logging all this data is becoming more and more critical when it comes to disengagements. So I'm going to jump right into it. Why do we need to log everything? You don't need to take it from me. You can just read all the safety reports that are out there. Uh, every autonomous vehicle manufacturer is responsible to develop a safety report. And I believe it's every month or every quarter. Don't quote me on those. But you can see some of the reports over here from Forbes and from 9 to 5 talking about the disengagements for autonomous driving. So although some, you know, a leader out there right now, we look at Google Waymo as a, as a leader, they've driven a lot more miles in 2018 than say in 2017, and they've had a considerable amount of disengagements, uh, a lower, I should say, the trend of disengagements is going down. So we're going in the right direction, but we're not there yet. And that's really the gold standard, I feel, out there right now. So you can to properly reconstruct and understand disengagements, we need to log data. I really don't think there's any, any, any big uh, epiphanies that I'm coming out with right now. What does logging data mean? It's taking all of this sensor data. You've got cameras, LIDAR, radar automotive ethernet. Now we see 10 gigabits per second ethernet creeping into the vehicle. So there's gigabytes of data being generated per second. So I'm going to jump in. I'm going to show you some examples, some use cases, and do a little bit of math. There will be a quiz at the end. Just kidding. Thinking about artificial intelligence or augmented intelligence, like our friends over here like to say it a little bit better. Um, where did it go? So thinking about one of our products, this is the Rad Gigalog in the center of the screen you can see. This can be used to bring all of your data together. Uh, at the bottom, there's something called a perception ECU from a company that we're working with, Comcar. So think about this for a second. How can you make your data logger a little bit more intelligent. And it's using artificial intelligence. It's getting more of those detection algorithms into the logged data. So you see these bullets on the bottom left. If you get, so you can see the numbers. I hope, hopefully they're clear. On the right side of the boxes, you see a one, two, three, and four. So just kind of step you through this real quick. If you've got a radar, and say it's grabbing your detection arrays. You may have 64 detection arrays. We can bring that information into a perception ECU, whether it's CAN or Ethernet. And let's leave that out of, out of the equation for just a second. But fundamentally, bringing that radar information into a data logger and your perception ECU allows you to go and stitch information together or fuse the data. So the radar information is giving you distance values. Your front-facing camera is typically not able to give you distance information, but it's able to give you the visualization of, of the scene. So with a perception ECU that can take the radar data, stitch together, say, bounding blocks or your classifications for the objects that you're seeing, and then above those blocks put the distance of where that person or subject is in front of the front-facing camera. So you take one, which is the detection array, you mix it with the front-facing image, you process that data, and you return a detection list, which is your fused vision output, your sensor data fused also together, and GPS and uh, inertial measurement unit data, this IMU data, all together. So this allows you to create more of an intelligent data logging system. So let's talk about 
the raw facts, bandwidth. I've got a demo outside talking about the camera technology and looking at just a simple two megapixel camera. So we've, we've all been conditioned by these things in our hand. I was just amazed that this camera is a 12 megapixel camera. We're all carrying 12 megapixel cameras in our pockets and in our vehicles we're only working with a 2 megapixel camera right now. Think about that for a second. Think about how much storage we have on this little thing. Think about how much storage we're going to need in the vehicle. And by the way, when you, when you look at the numbers for your camera, this is all compressed. When we start talking about raw data, this is how professional photographers would shoot a picture or a video. It's called raw data. I'm going to walk you through the bits and the bytes of that. You've got a two megapixel camera at a specific resolution at some frames per second. You would take and figure out how many pixels per second will this camera produce. So you do the math and in this equation I'm using 16 bits for the camera pixel format that we happen to be using in the camera. You come out to around a bandwidth of 995 megabits per second. So I, I want people to think about that because when we start going to say a one gigabit per second two wire ethernet, if you want to transmit this two megapixel camera and transmit the raw information over that, you're already at your bandwidth cap. So you have to watch what type of physical interface you're going to use for your camera technology. So now, let's think about, that was the bandwidth, but now let's think about the storage. So if you take that 995 megabits per second, divided by your frames per second, you get around 33 megabits. Divide that by eight, you get around 4.1 megabytes per frame. So a two megapixel camera, every 30 frames a second, so you're gonna get 30 images a second, that each image will be four megabytes. So you take that and equate it for a, a minute. So you got about seven, 7.38 megabytes per minute. And if you go in one day, multiply that by day, you know, hours. So now you get minutes by hours. You're looking at 3.5 terabytes per day, per eight hour day of storage, image storage. That kind of just frames the idea of how this data really starts stacking up very quickly. And of course, that's one camera. So now if you have, we all don't have one camera in our autonomous vehicles, that would be a little bit laughable. There's typically four to six cameras in a simple autonomous vehicle right now, not even considering the LIDAR and ri radar and whatnot around the vehicle. So just trying to frame why do we need six and 64 terabytes of storage? So again, aggregating all of this storage is going to be critical. Looking at high bandwidth logging, cameras, LIDAR, radar, you know, we're not even talking about 4K cameras or even I hear 8K cameras coming out. Those would even be more storage, of course. So of course, your off-the-shelf components, not easily able to be used in a vehicle. They don't have the right temperature ranges. They don't have the right voltage ranges. I was talking to somebody this morning just looking at a, a simple 12-volt to 5-volt converter, and he said, wait, I don't want to reinvent anything. I don't want to, I, I want something to work right out of the box. And this is that concept that we came up with. The Gigalog. You're able to record autonomous controller information, whether it's camera, can, flex ray. You're able to log all that information. So those are the, the inputs. So you're able to log 10 gig ethernet, two additional ethernet ports, a 100 or one, one gig. We're also able to record two 100 base T1 interfaces. We'll have four camera inputs, eight CAN-FD, and two flex ray receive-only channels available in this one compact box. 
for low power usage, you're looking at about 18, 20 watts of power in this box. Really a lot of bang for the buck at the end of the day. We have multiple ways to bring the data and offload the data. You'll see it in the next slide. And we've got programmable LEDs to show you how much storage that you've used and as the capacity inside your device. And we can also synchronize this to other products that Intrepid sells or stack the products up. So say you do have five cameras or six cameras, you might need two of these products working together to store that data for you to then offload and be able to simulate again. So in this use case scenario, this would be high speed data logging. So you've got your two cameras in the center. We bring and tap those cameras. So the, the critical part is you work with your products or your production components. You work with a production camera or you work with your cameras that are in the vehicle. You work with your own autonomous controller. The beauty of a tap is that you don't interfere with that connection. It's a small little bit of latency, but very tolerable, say about a one microsecond latency between that camera image being deserialized, and then we reserialize that image using an FPGA. So highly accurate, and you don't sacrifice any latency by using a tap. Of course, at the same time, we'll be reading all of the CAN FD information and say 100 base T1, so that's that automotive ethernet. And then maybe your controller is sending back a 10 gigabit ethernet. So you can see very quickly all the connections in this one strategy. And of course, we have a little bit of a microphone that can actually pick up your GPS location and you can annotate. So you can use the microphone to trigger a recording and tell it, hey, this was a cut in maneuver, this was a cut out, this is a follow, follow through maneuver. Um, you can get that annotations as a separate file to be able to allow you to quickly find that one scenario that you uh, had a disengagement in. Another scenario would be logging, say, eight cameras, and that would, say, use two or three or even four devices. So I showed the math in the beginning because we need to do that equation stack up to figure out do we have enough bandwidth, maybe depending on your type of camera, megapixels and your resolution, we might not be able to do that with a four input. We may only be limited to say two inputs. So this is why when we, we engage with customers, we always ask right up front, what is your resolution? What type of camera are you using? What is your megapixels? So we can do those stack ups for you. In this scenario, sometimes we don't live in a perfect world. You need to convert from one camera interface to another camera interface, or just bring that data and rip it out as an ethernet stream. That's another use case scenario. Or converting from one camera interface to another camera interface. So if you've got a camera that's GM GMSL, but then your controller does FPD link three, we're looking at supporting these other interfaces as well. And then you can use the Gigalog actually as a network application storage device. So you can take data from a galaxy and pipe it over to the Gigalog to now record tons and tons of data. Some of the, the galaxy might be limited in the number of SD cards or whatnot at the time when it was developed. Well, now we can offload that data to the Gigalog. Or if people have a Neo Ion, we can offload that data right to the Gigalog. Or if you're doing something like a CM probe or XCP, you know, that data from the controllers are coming faster and faster. So you can record all of that and then visualize that with Vehicle Spy. So this is just showing the Gigalogs all stacked up and then another device in the back. And this right there is the microphone that you can use. That's a really, really interesting microphone because it picks up a GPS information and allows you to press a button to do the triggering and the voice annotation as well. So it's a, it's a great, little, great little mic to be in the vehicle. So you don't really need a laptop. You set up your scripts on the device. You put the device in the vehicle. And your whole interface is this little microphone. Or you can create a switch or some type of other trigger. But at the, at the same time, you're trying to drive. 
and log data. One critical thing is when you're starting to do development, you need to string together all the different tools that are needed for the development. And we have a, a power injector, you can see that outside. We have a 5, 9, and 12 volt selection to be able to power the camera over this, say, FPD link or GMSL um, link from the, uh, from the camera to our power injector. And then we strip off that power when we go back to our device. The interesting thing is we can actually pass the camera configuration from your controller right to the camera through our Gigalog device. Well, that's a good takeaway point because if you have any problems configuring your camera, we could capture that information and be able to see that for you. We could also configure the camera for you as well. So being able to configure the disks is one of the most critical points. Having a data logging system that can meet the physical challenges of high-speed data logging, we've created several disks that we can write in parallel using a RAID 0 approach. And this is how you bring up that, that uh, write speed to those cards. We have three different extraction modes we can use. So we can offload that data using a 10 gig port. You can offload the data using a 100 meg, uh, um, uh, one gig, or you could offload that data using USB 3.0. So those are the different methods that you can offload that data. In the future, we're looking at getting past the six terabyte limit and also utilizing something like an external um, card that will actually, you could pull the card out of the device and take it back to your, uh, your desk. So then you could work and extract the data at your desk and leave the device in the vehicle. So another usage case scenario is playing the data back. So now you went and collected eight hours of data. You know, you you know again when like right when I started, I said time is one of our most precious things, and we don't have the ability or we don't want to pay for additional costs of going and doing test drives. So being able to log and collect all that data as much as possible when you're out at the test track is becoming more and more critical. Um, you don't have enough time in an eight hour day to look at all the anomalies that you will probably discover in your algorithms at a test track. You need to log all that data and then go back and sift through it so we're coming up with intelligent ways to log and view that data for you. In this playback mode, we'll actually log the raw images, and then we can replay the images in Vehicle Spy. It might not be the exact raw image. What we would do is we would downsample that a little bit, or we would compress it to be able to visually see that on the computer. But what's good is that exact image whether it's RAW or JPEG, can be displayed in the exact time and you can see exactly what's going on with CAN or Ethernet. So you can correlate. I got my detection 200 milliseconds after the image detected that the brake lights were turning on, right? So now how do you correlate an automatic emergency braking maneuver? So you need to have a front-facing camera. As soon as that camera senses the brake lights are turned on, how long does it take for your controllers to actually hit those brakes? At what point, at what distance, do you actually invoke automatic emergency braking? I don't want to test that without logging a heck of a lot of data, because I don't want to do that too many times, personally. I've done it already coming here, maybe twice today. Got a little too close to the vehicle in front of me, and that pre-crash warning showed up in my vehicle. That's uh, very alarming. But at the same time, you're able to record that data and replay it to make that analysis. Again, you don't have the ability to look at everything during that test drive, but when you replay the data, you can go in there and look at it with a fine tooth comb. So, thanks everybody. I appreciate your attention. Uh, let me know if you have any questions.